Hello, I'm Ron Miscavige, and this is Life After Scientology. By the way, that little piece of music you heard is from uh, my album that I did in 74. It's called Barnum and Gumbo. Uh, I wrote that, and uh, I never tasted gumbo in my life. But then I had a chance to go to New Orleans later on, and I had some. But that, that's the name of that song. Listen, before we get into the program itself, I want to thank Fran Bridge, who has contributed money to my Patreon account. So thank you very much, Fran. And I do appreciate it. Uh, it helps because I want to keep these shows going all the time. And your your help is very much appreciated. And those of you who might want to help out on this or contribute something, uh, the link, the Patreon link is in the description of the video, just for your information. Okay, so let's get into it. And this morning, I have a very special guest. And uh, his name is Matt Pesh. And he is the husband of Amy, who I had on in a prior uh, interview. Matt has one hell of a story to tell. I got to tell you. And uh, without getting into a whole bunch of talk over nothing, let's get right into it. So, Matt, good morning. And I welcome you to the show, buddy. Good morning. Good to be oh, here. Yeah, thanks. Now, as with my other interviews that I do, what I'd like to do is just get started, like, from the beginning. And just tell us, how did you get in Scientology? How did you get involved? Well, I was uh, 20 years old, and I was living on Long Island. I had my own apartment. And I was kind of just kicking around doing different manual jobs and things like that and hitchhiking around the United States, up and down the coast, up to Canada. And, uh, you know, just kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. And a friend of mine told me about this thing called Scientology, which I'd never heard of before. And it turned out there was this little house down the street that was Scientology. It was a little, what they call a mission, which is a little starter place. It has like four staff members and maybe 10 public that go to it, right? So I go down there and uh, I sign up for the communications course, kind of just something to do in the evening. Just I'm just kind of playing around, you know. And... Uh, on a break, you know, I'd go next door to the bar and get a beer, come back to the, you know, to the course room. You know, I just, it was just something to do. And, and by, uh, the way, by the way, on that, yeah, you didn't tell the course supervisor you had a beer when you came back, did you? Yeah, they found out about it. I got kicked off the course for two weeks and I came back. And funny enough, the night that I came back, they had some girl stopping by to show a, a slideshow of what was happening in Los Angeles. and. It was, you know, showing guys doing uh, fix-ups of the building, renovations of the hospital complex that they had purchased there. And it was all sunny and palm trees. And, you know, I'm in New York, and it's like two feet of snow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they said, yeah, you can go there and learn how to do renovations construction, which I was interested in. I, I probably more than a lot more than Scientology at the time. Right. And uh you could also get all these expensive courses and all this kind of stuff that was supposed to make you like superhuman kind of stuff, you know, all the promotion on that. Yeah. And you would get that for free if you worked there. And I thought, yeah, what the heck, you know, I'll go, I'll check that out. So I, I wasn't even a Scientologist, really. You can't, you couldn't consider me a Scientologist. I knew really very little about Scientology. So uh, I went and saw the girl and I said, hey, I want to go do that. You know, she thought I was like kidding her. And she said, well, what would you have to do to do it? And I said, well, I just bought a car yesterday. I have to return that and I have to bring the keys back to my job and I have to clean out my apartment and I have to say goodbye to some people. I said, you know, I can leave tomorrow. And then she really thought I was kidding her. Yeah. And she said, I'll tell you what, you come back with a plane ticket and then, you know, I'll know you're serious. So I came back with the plane ticket and I left the next day and I arrive in Los Angeles. I'm going to, you know, supposed to be joining this group. That's all these super duper dudes. And I get to the airport and of course there's nobody to pick me up. It's like one o'clock in the morning. Right. And then finally, this guy shows up, and he looks like they just drug him out of bed, and he's all he's missing buttons on his coat, and he's kind of holding it across. And we go to his car, and he's got the door tied off with a piece of rope. And I'm like, what the heck, right? Right. Yeah. When we get to the complex, <clears throat> and they had just purchased it, you know, a year earlier, a few months earlier. So it's all surrounded by a big fence, and it's got three strands of barbed wire across the top. And at the gate, there's this uh, renter cop there with the big German shepherd. And I'm like, holy shit. This place oh. looks like an insane asylum. <laughs> so we go inside and they tell me I got to go up to the, some room on the sixth floor. And the elevator doesn't work. So I, you know, walk up there. I walk in this room and I'm like, holy shit. Should I leave now or should I wait for the morning? I think I just hitchhiked the West Coast for a while and, you know, 
yeah. get on to the next adventure. So I thought, ah, I'll get a little bit of sleep and I'll leave in the morning. So as soon as the sun starts coming up, I go down the fire escape on the opposite side of the building from where the security guy is with his dog. Yeah. I throw my bag over the fence. I jump the fence and I head down to a local restaurant to get breakfast before I take off. I run into a Sea Org member in there with a uniform on and stuff. And I kind of start talking with him. And he said, oh, no, you know, come on back. I'll show you. You know, the guys are all working there and blah, blah, blah. So I said, all right, you know, let's go back. Show me. So we walk in there and there's a couple of guys that were spray painting, taking a break and they're rolling cigarettes, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I never seen guys roll cigarettes. You know, people buy cigarettes. Right. I mean, in the institution, I've seen somebody doing that. But so I'm like, wow, you guys smoke pot here. I said, they give me trouble about that back in New York, you know? And the guy's like, no, 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 you know, we're not smoking pot. I mean, that's how green I was, right? Yeah. yeah. So I started doing work with them and I, I hear the guys talking behind me that are running the thing that how they're going to get the uh, the floors all stripped and waxed there. And they're doing the ASHO, the Advanced St. Hill Organization building, trying to get that ready for the people to move into, right? Right. So I turn around and say, hey, I know how to do all that stuff. I can do that for you. And they said, what would you need? And I told them. So they set me up. I finished all those floors, just you know, moving the last stuff into the building. And, you know, in those those days, uh, it was such a rush to get things done. New guys, we didn't do any study. Like usually new recruits, they get five hours a day to do the basic courses to kind of get introduced to everything. And oh, yeah. we, there was no study. So um, we finished that job and they said, well, we're going to send you on a mission. We want to send you on a mission. I'm like, was it like Mission Impossible? I thought maybe they're having trouble with somebody or something. I don't know, you know. Yeah. So they said, go to such and such a room in the building. So I go there and I walk in. They realize I don't know nothing, you know. And uh, they put me one on one with a little supervisor to kind of get some basic courses on, you know, that I'm going to need to be able to do this mission. They take me to this office, this big office, and they show me a desk with a typewriter and a phone. And I'm like, man, you got you got me confused with somebody. You know, if you took all the time I've ever been on a telephone in my life, it's probably less than an hour. I've wow. never typed. I don't, you know, wh what's the deal here, you know? And I said, no, no, no mistake, you know. You're going to be in charge of uh, purchasing all the different things we need for our next building. You know, I'm going to call up on the phone, get the best quotes. Then i got to type up a whole submission on why those materials, you know, why that quantity, all this kind of stuff. Which I was like the seventh on this uh, project. It's called the mission, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm number seven on the totem pole there. So, you know, it was good for me because I was actually learning all this stuff. I'd call up about, you know, I want to buy five doors this size. And the guy would say, is that a right-hand door or a left-hand door? I'm like, what? So I'd have to, like, learn about it. And I'd, you know, call about wire. Is that stranded, solid? You know, all the hardware, all the plumbing. I was, like, learning all this different stuff. But the, uh, the crazy part was we were only allowed three hours sleep a day. Yeah. And the way it worked in my office was we had a pillow on the floor. And you took turns one hour at a time per the clock on that pillow. And, uh, you know, the girl that was in charge, she was like about 30 years old. She would fall asleep with her face on the typewriter and the phone would ring, wanting to talk to her. We'd have to get underneath her arms and start walking her body around the office till her feet started working. And she'd have the, all the, the uh, typewriter keys imprinted on her face. It was bad. You know, so I'll what was you, happening? Go ahead. Matt, I got to say something. Yeah. You know, people watching this are thinking, is he making it up? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. It's almost standard what you're saying. And right. I'm smiling because what you're saying to me seems unbelievable to a person who's never experienced working with this group. And in those days, uh, it, this is fascinating because it's just bringing back humorous memories. But a lot of them aren't that humorous when you're going through it. Anyway, right. I just wanted to interject. That. So continue on, buddy. All right. So, of course, you know. One person at the next in the office, they're going to go to the bathroom and you never see him again. And pretty soon I'm the one left. I'm in charge. Jesus <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, man, this place is crazy because the same thing with the guys doing the work on the, on the, on the building, they're not getting sleep. You know, I walk over there and this guy's sleeping in the bathroom, sleeping in literally in the closet. You open a closet door to somebody sitting in there sleeping. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, this is they're wasting people. I mean, this isn't a sprint. This the Scientology thing, it's got to be more of a long distance race. You know, I couldn't understand why they were just so willing to burn people out like that. But I'm like, all right, I'm still kind of I'm learning. I'm kind of still curious. I'm still wondering if the Scientology part, you know, the ordering part and all that stuff, the counseling is any good. 
and I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of sticking it out. So I finished that project. Everything works out good. We get the billing done in time, which, by the way, you know, they're doing it in this kind of speed because they think by having these billings completed, they're going to do some kind of crazy expansion. But we moved the people into that building, the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles, and it was tight quarters when we moved them in. That's 40 years ago, and they've never needed a bigger building. Right. Just to show the lack of expansion. The same thing with the first place, the, the Asho place. They were making, it was two parts to it at that point. They were making about 150000 to $200,000 a week back then. And that's when minimum wage was $2 an hour. Well, right. minimum wage now in Los Angeles is $15 an hour. And they're still making about the same amount of money, 150000 to 200000 a week. Yep. So, so the idea that they're like, that it worked, that they actually expanded there is, is not true. So, but to go on, so they tell me, okay, um, we want you now to be, we're going to form an organization called the Packer States Renovations Org. And we're oh, going to- Wait, I, I missed that. Yeah. Right? After I finished doing, the, uh, doing that mission, now they want to post me on a post, right? They want to give me like an actual post title. Yeah. And I'm going to be like basically doing the same function. It's going to be the treasury secretary of this new renovations organization they're forming up. Yeah. So I said, okay, you know what? I said, you know, I'll do that. But uh, under, under one circumstance, I get every Saturday off. I said, because I, I got to go, I'm going to make money outside here. They were paying guys $2 a, a week. I mean, literally, they open the envelope and there's $2 in there. And I said, I'm not even going to stand in line for two bucks. You guys got to be kidding me, you know? So, oh, course, yeah. so I, I never did stand in line for it. I just, this is bullshit, right? So I said, I need, a, I need one day off. I don't care about statistics. I don't care about, you know, what the deal is. I get every Saturday off. So they agreed to it, believe it or not, back then. Wow. And I got a job selling uh, snow cones on Venice Beach on Saturdays. Uh, I sell them for 50 cents, get 10 cents a, a commission on each snow cone. I was doing like 700 to 1,000 a day. Wow. And uh, so things are going good for about three months. Everything's going good. I'm getting my, I have my job. I'm making money, doing my, you know, my post there. And then one day I get asked if I want to go work with L. Ron Hubbard. And I'm like, L. Ron Hubbard? I mean, why would you want me to go work with L. Ron Hubbard? I said, does he need somebody to rake his leaves? That's actually what I said. Do you need somebody to rake his leaves? I'm not even really a Scientologist. I had no intention of staying there more than you know a few months or a year. I never thought I'd be there for 27 years. Wow. You know, it just oh, it yeah. never even crossed my mind. But I said, all right, you know, you want me to go work with L. Ron Hubbard? I'll go. I'll go do it. What the heck, you know? So they said, all right, be on such and such a corner on such and such a uh, uh, time in, in Los Angeles, and somebody will pick you up. So we, that happened, you know, get picked up by a vehicle and it's like 007 at switching vehicles They're you know, they're checking all this electronic shit, whatever. And we wind up at uh, Palm Springs. So I worked there for a few weeks renovating L. Ron Hubbard's home. And which was pretty like like a middle class type of home. It wasn't anything fancy at all. Yeah. And uh, then I said, OK, well, go ahead. did you actually meet him when you were there? No, I'd never met him. Okay. Never ever met him. One thing that I will say though, you know, the next crazy thing I run into there is that his space, his office has to be like dust particle free. Do you understand? Right. It's not like just clean. It's got to be no dust because this guy's supposed to be so superhuman that he can't tolerate a dust particle. He could smell a plate that's been washed and tell you what was eaten on it you know a mouse farts in the back closet of the house and you can tell you what the mouse ate or something you know it's like it was crazy stuff right yeah and being another person is supposed to uh white glove this little office it took us 48 hours straight i mean every rag had to be specially cleaned in a special wash machine by you know somebody who would special smell check it and it comes in in a plastic bag and you got to wipe the thing real slow and just get that dust out and it goes back into a plastic bag i mean it was crazy it was crazy stuff but i thought i don't know you know maybe the guy is superhuman or something i don't know i'm just kind of going along with the flow to kind of you know see what's going to happen right right so anyway they say okay now you guys are going to go to this new property report which is the international base in hemet california it's where they have the international management these days. It's where they have Golden Era Studios. And we had just taken over the property. And uh, there was maybe 15 of us got sent. They're all young guys that, you know, had never really done any construction renovations before. 
So we start fixing up the buildings. We even build a, a, a studio there, a soundstage studio from ground up without being able to hire anybody from the outside. And it was a, it was a great adventure. I mean, we were learning and we were proud of ourselves and, yeah. you know, it was going good. Then uh, I get asked uh, to be the security. They're going to form a security unit there on the base. And they want me to be in charge of the security and, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, it was David. David Miscavige was the one that pulled me into the office and told me that, you know, he wanted me to pick some guys and we're going to make the security uh, uh, outfit and all that. Well, not, what did I think about it? And it was funny. I said, you know, I think I'm going to feel pretty weird dressed up like a, a rent -a cop you know. And he just laughed. He thought that was funny. And uh, but we 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 found the security. Security back then is nothing like it developed into. We didn't have the fences. We didn't have uh, the bob wire and you know the razor wire and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, boy, Matt. In those days, yeah. there wasn't even a fence around the property. There wasn't even a fence. We had no concept of keeping staff in. If somebody wanted to leave, they were gone within two or three days. They would just get a quick little check and, and be allowed to leave. Yep. Oh, yeah. And people could wander onto the property. I just want to tell this little. Yeah, amusement. yeah go ahead. Uh, in the mess hall or the place where we used to eat, it right. was called MCI, short for Massacre Canyon Inn. Right. And in there, there was a composer and arranger by the name of Barry Stein. Right. He had his piano next to the bar, the old bar that was in there when it was active as a resort. Right. And one day a guy comes in, sits at the bar and says to him, let me have a Bud Light. That's a true story. The guy thought right. the thing was still open. He wanted to get a beer to have it down there. But no fence, no no anything. Not at all like it is now, which right now, anyway, go on, continue. Yeah. I, I mean, back then, if a person just took off, you know, it's called like, you know, it's called blowing in Scientology terms where you don't ask permission to leave. You just like disappear in the night. Yeah. We never even had the concept of chasing the person down like they do these days and hiring private investigators to, to follow the guy and sending out teams of staff to, to find them, you know, later the, the security chief, you know, you've done interviews with him. He said he brought, he hunted down and brought back hundreds of people, right? To that base. Yeah. Literally hundreds of people. And uh, we didn't, there was no declaring people suppressive person or something like that. Like they, like they do these days where you can't talk to your family and you're kind of like cut off from anybody you've ever known in Scientology. We would just write a thing and put it in the person's folder saying the guy, you know, the guy took off. And so if he ever wants to come back, he has to do some amends to the group or something like that. You know, it was real simple. Yeah. So anyway, that was the most of what we did was was protection of the property from fire. That was like 90 percent of that job. I got it. And uh, so after security, I went back on to doing running the construction and renovation stuff again. And now it's started getting pretty interesting on that base because. Uh, they brought in, there's a thing called the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force. And it's kind of like for those people who have a bad attitude or they don't produce the way they're supposed to, they get kind of sent to, it's like almost like a North Korean concentration camp kind of setup. Right. They got to run everywhere. They uh, got to call everybody sir. They have no contact with their spouse and children. Um, you know, it's they do hard labor. Back then, it usually you can usually get off in a couple of years, whatever. Later on, it became way, way worse. But anyway, they brought in these people from all these different RPF units from different bases, Scientology bases like Los Angeles, Clearwater, uh, uh, England, these kind of things. They brought them all to the international base, and they were supposed to get all these different projects done so that L. Ron Hubbard could return and work at that base, right? Yep. The problem is these guys they weren't being given any kind of time to do the program that would allow them to be released. And they, they left behind their wives, their children. And they were like, you know, they were running like slaves, really. Sometimes they'd work two, three, some, one time, four days with no sleep. We were talking, we're in the desert. We're working construction around the clock. Right. I mean, it was nasty. So these guys are coming to me. I'm working the same schedule as them, but I'm not in the RPF. I'm the person outside the RPF that's responsible for running the projects. And they're saying, you know, well, what's the deal? How do I get out of this place? You know, when are we going to go on study time? And I'd say, you know, what I was being told, you get the next job done, then we're going to go back on to get the study. And of course, we'd finish the next project and they'd be told, no, now it's going to be the next project and then it's going to be the next project. And this is going on for a while. <clears throat> so it was bad. I mean, I was, I was literally, I'm six foot four. I was down to 163 pounds. Jesus 
Christ, you got. I was be- bones, man. I was bones. I was exhausted. That's thin. And, uh, yeah, that's 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 bad. And uh, I got called into the. Well, we we put him back on. They started study finally for the first day, right? And I get called into an office and told, I got to tell these guys that we're going to play a game. And I'm like, what's the game, right? Yeah. The game is, you know, if they could get like two years of uh, construction projects done over the next eight weeks, basically they could you know, keep down the schedule. They could stay on study. And it is like, it's impossible. I'm like, that's no game. I'm not, I'm not announcing that. And I put my foot down and it became a bit, you know, of a, a scene. So now I'm considered disaffected because I'm not going with the flow. I'm refusing to run the slave labor camp anymore. Right. So then they say, okay, good. So now you're assigned to the slave labor camp. <laughs> right. so you were putting the RPF at that point. Say that again? So you were putting the RPF at that point, right? Yeah. And for me, you know what it was? I was already in, in the Sea Oak for five years and I had done no Scientology, right? I mean, I had learned construction. I was great and I yeah. was happy for that, but I was still curious. Is the Scientology stuff, does it work, right? I don't, I don't know. I have I've not experienced any of it. Yeah. So by getting assigned to the RPF, two things is going to happen. One, I'm going to leave the base. They're going to send me to Clearwater. And uh, second is now I'm going to finally have a chance maybe to experience Scientology because when you're on RPF, you're supposed to get five hours a day, you know, ordering, counseling each other back and forth. Right. So I'm like, cool. This is this is a good thing for me. I'm yeah. like happy to get the heck out of there. So I go to Clearwater and I do that for a few weeks working on their crystal ballroom and then they they actually fly me back to international base to do my old job from the, the position of being in the rpf hey. i'm like well, <laughs> but after a few days you know it was seen hey this guy's disaffected he's not supposed to be here so then i guess i sent get sent to uh to los angeles to do the rpf which i did i didn't get paid the whole entire time i was there not a penny really yeah and i i was there for the next year and a half and I completed the RPF. And then I got sent to Clearwater to run the construction there, which I did. And uh, we're working on the Fort Harrison Hotel, fixing all that place up. And then they wanted me to be in charge of what's called uh, Flag Crew, which is the uh, organization there that takes care of all the buildings, the food for the public, uh, food for the crew, transport, all that stuff. I have about 200 staff members under me. I get, I get, Post as that, but the organization is a million dollars in solvent. It's got a million dollars worth of outstanding bills, wow. and it was bad. There was like, you know, there was uh, the guys that were bringing the food. Cisco, they were going to close, the, you know, not give any more food. Uh, one of the buildings that we were renting, they were going to lock the front doors. I mean, the telephones going to be shut off. I mean, it was bad. Okay, and, well, uh, Matt, man. about what year was that? What, what year that was eighty eight, nineteen eighty eight. Okay. Now I've been in for 10 years. Hmm. And, uh, but anyway, I ran the place for a few months and I got the bills down to zero. And basically what's, what it is is the organization is com- completely fixated in bringing money in, but it's kind of dumb on how it spends its money a lot of times. Right. And really what I did was I fixed up how the money was being spent. It didn't really change much of what was coming in, just what was going, how it was being spent and all those different waste and different things like that. And it only took a few months. I had all the bills paid off. Now, let me tell you something. Yeah. If you did this in the real world, not inside the bubble, at that point, you would have probably been making at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. At least, I would say, to, to pull somebody back from the edge of going out of business to where they're solvent again, that's... That's not an easy thing to do. Right. And how much were you getting paid at that point? Uh, about 18 bucks a week. <laughs> and that was when you got paid, right? When we got paid, yeah. Okay, all right, continue. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's a long story, and I can tell you how I did it. It was actually pretty brilliant, I will say. And the truth is, at the end of it, you know what happened? I got removed from that post. Jesus Christ. <laughs> because I'm surprised. I don't know. <laughs> I'm surprised. That's normal, isn't it? When you yeah, come- it's normal. Because this crazy woman uh, she, that was up in management, she wanted, you know, L. Ron Hubbard said that the place should be five star. Now, that hotel, to make it five star, it's, it's ridiculous. The rooms are so tiny. The bathroom is so tiny. I mean, you literally almost have to hold on to the sink to sit on the toilet. You know, it's like it's not it's not what a five star hotel is even to start with the floor plan of the place. Right. Yeah. 
Now, my viewpoint was get the money handled and then let's go from one star to two stars. Let's go from two stars to three stars. You know, let's just take it on and grade it and bring this thing along. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I got removed. She came down from international management and proceeded to put the place in solvent by about $150,000 the first week. She just went out and purchased all these little goodies and robes and shampoo bottles and shit and with no money approved, with no money set aside and put the place in solvent again. Was that Jenny? Yep, Jenny. Jenny yep. Lindstein, the famous, you know, you know, my husband, you know, this, you know, the one inch and all this kind of stuff, whatever. But it's like. Yeah, I know every square inch of his body. Yeah, she's like this on the on a. Well, um, before we that, let's explain how that happened because <laughs> some of our viewers may have not seen that video. There, there were how many was it? Five wives. Three, three wives. Okay, just tell that so we know what the hell the audience knows what we're talking about. All right, so basically, there was accusations that David Miscavige was beating people up. Right, there's so many people that have said they were beat by him that they've seen people beat by him. This kind of thing. So, uh, on Anderson Cooper's show. They bring in three of these wives that uh, are still in the C organization. One of them was this Jenny uh, Devok Lindstein, whatever her name is. And they're they're telling Anderson that they know that their husbands were never beat by David Miscavige because they knew every you know she told me I just seen I was I knew every square inch of his body. She puts her hands out about a foot long, you know. Yeah, <laughs> kind of like the joke. Yeah. <clears throat> And, you know, I would have seen if there was any, you know, bruises on his body and stuff. The truth was, most of the time, they weren't even on the same side of the United States and stuff like that. But they're, they were there lying for their, yeah, you know, for the whole. For the greater good, right? For the greater good, yeah, protecting David Miscavige. So, anyway. So, anyway, um, go, go yeah. the story. I, I wanted to get that point in. So, maybe if somebody didn't see the show, they know what the hell we're talking about. So, now she comes down and buys all these goodies and throw you back into insolvency again. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, whatever. I go back to run the renovations. We go down to the Sandcastle. We're doing that routine down there. Um, and pretty soon they want me to go to the organization, which is called the Flag Service Organization, which delivers all the Scientology services. They're in Clearwater. They make about $2 million a week. They, they bring in more money in Clearwater than all the rest of Scientology combined. Right. But at the time, they weren't making very good money you know the, the the money was down and they thought if they moved me over there to kind of run all the people that make the money and kind of beat them up a little bit or whatever not not physically but kind of like use the you know push these guys they could make more money right so um so i go do that for about a year i hated it it was crazy it was criminal it was like used car lot stuff where um all the information about these public that show up it, they, they've already got all their finance information, all their personal information. Um, they they assign the reg, the person that goes after the money from these people, um, based on the buyer type, you know, which is already understood before they show up. They have to go through this whole routing form where they're put through seeing all these different type of money making people from different units. Um, Scientology kind of shifted from just selling Scientology to selling, getting people just to donate straight money where no service was uh, needed to give back to them. They would be given money to translate the materials. They'd be given money to donate books to libraries, to uh, way to happen, you know, these little booklets, you know, to give these out to people on the streets. You know, all the, there was all these different things that a, a public person would be asked to give money to of which there was there was no accounting for that money, how it would be used. They would never be able to find out if it was really used that way, uh, how was it used, whatever. And there's no delivery needed to be going back to that person. Right. In other words, it was something for nothing. Something for nothing. Yeah. And there was a reason for that because <clears throat> the prepayments, just that flag alone, like people would put prepay for courses and counseling. And it would go on to an account for them. And there was $400 million oh. on account, unused, which people at that time could ask for back. Do you understand? They could say, you know what? I'm done with Scientology. Give me back my $100,000. Wait, you're talking, you said $400 million? $400 million just in Clearwater. Jesus Christ. 
So, I mean, it's quite a liability to be carrying as an organization. No, I did not know that. And I know a lot about the insides of Scientology. That is brand new news to me right at this moment. I, I got to tell you, man. Anyway. And it was getting worse every week, you know, because we would be delivering about a hundred, about uh, 1.4, 1.5 million, but we were taking in 2 million. Some weeks we took in 5 million. Some weeks we took in 7 million. I mean, it was growing fast, this liability. So the whole concept was, you know, I'm sure from management was, hey, we can't just, we can't survive selling Scientology. They weren't, they were insolvent like crazy. So they had to switch off to trying to get money for nothing. And that's, Scientology took a big turn. And to this day, I mean, you'll see the magazine, it's all about, you know, hyping up all these people that give the millions of dollars for nothing. Yep. And it's very little attention on the people that are paying for actual service. That I know to be true. I've seen some of these magazines and it's all to the IAS or some building fund or maybe a new building they're going to buy. God knows. Yeah, that, that whole, you know, ideal org kind of thing. It's just it's just another part of that whole scam, which is to get the local people to pay for a big, beautiful building, which they don't need because they already have like nobody in them. Yeah. But they, they get these people to pay for it. The local organization does not own that building. That billing is owned by international management. And that local church rents that billing from international management. Even so, though their contributions built it. Yep. So they never get to own it. They just get to rent it, even though it's their contributions from that little local church community that paid for that billing. And, you know, the big statistic up at international management is called assets and reserves, which is, you know, this whole real estate thing is reserves and assets. It's it's growing their statistic. It makes them look like they're really doing great because financially they are doing great. They've grown this whole real estate thing, but it has nothing to do with Scientology. It has nothing to do with helping anybody. Wow. I'll tell you, I don't know who made up. I, I think it was maybe Mark Headley who said this one time and I like the description. He said, Scientology is a cult disguised as a religion operating as a business that's completely correct yeah, go on it's completely correct yeah so so anyway so after being in charge of making the money for you which i hated i got switched over to be in charge of treasury which is all the the spending part nothing could be spent by the organization without me approving every single little penny of it right right that's that's the money that gets given back to us i should explain something else when a, when a church, even the one in uh, Clearwater, none of the money that comes in from the public actually comes into a bank account that we control. Every It all goes into bank accounts. And this is for Scientology International. Any church, quote unquote church, that brings in money from its, its uh, public parishioners, that money goes into a bank account that's controlled by international management. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, international management can decide if it wants to give any of that money back to that local church to allow it to continue to operate. And they can decide how much. It could be zero or it could be, you know, a percentage of it. In Clearwater, if we brought in two million, we got back 350,000. And, it, and, and uh, that was to put, put back into making more money to pay for, the, for the, the different operating costs and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So wait a minute. You'd pull in two million, you got three hundred and fifty thousand out of it. The rest went to international management. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that's just a concept. So then then we have to say, okay, we got three hundred and fifty thousand. This is how we want to spend it. If you give us that money, they haven't given it to me yet, but they're saying that's what we're gonna give it to you. But show me a financial plan. What are you gonna spend it on? And show me how that money is gonna make more money. So you have to put this whole big plan together give it to international finance, the representative that's there in Clearwater, it gets approved and then you get the money and then you have to disperse it and account for it exactly the way it's supposed to be spent. Right. All right. I'd always make sure that I had uh, like emergency money kind of set aside because emergencies would come up such as somebody would go completely nuts, right? right? And which can happen with all the pressure and no sleep and these kind of things. 
and also it happened with public quite a bit because they're getting this counseling that kind of makes them kind of go cuckoo sometimes. Yeah. And you have to have money immediately to get these guys sent off someplace, right? A lot of times these people would be escorted and dropped off at a Scientology relative, or if they had no Scientology relatives, they'd be dropped off on the doorstep of some relative and give them the problem of this person who, you know, is one cuckoo. The other thing that would happen is sometimes you'd have uh, people who do criminal acts, which included child molesting, rape, these kind of things. The church would never turn these people in. Right. What they would do is they want them shipped off as fast as possible to someplace else where they were out of state and, you know, it wouldn't come back on them. I mean, uh, Karen Delacare, when she was writing up after her son died, she was writing up something on the computer and she mentioned she didn't understand why her 13 year old son had then uh, moved from Clearwater to Los Angeles. And it was kind of like a mystery to her. And I read that and I was like, I know why your son was moved from Clearwater to Los Angeles. He was raped by an adult and they wow. needed him out of there immediately. Why do I know that? Because any of that money that moves, I got to see how it moved, why it's moving. Why does it, why do you need plane tickets within an hour for somebody? Why right. was there no prediction on this? Right. So I, you know, I, I, I let her know what the deal was on that. And, uh, you know, it was, it was nasty stuff. The church is, is nasty, man. I'll tell you, these are horror stories. I'll tell you the worst thing about this is you're telling the truth. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be more tolerable if this guy was making up all this stuff, but hey, Matt, okay. <laughs> Continue on. All this. right. Yeah. So basically I reached a point. Oh yeah. As a treasury secretary, my main uh, job per policy is to make sure there's no free service being given away. Right. Yeah. So it turns out that the family of uh, Tom Cruise is down there and they're getting over a hundred thousand dollars worth of free auditing, which is completely off policy. And you know, the people that are delivering, they don't want to deliver it. They can't count on a statistic, the delivery they're doing because there's no invoice for it, but everybody's kind of afraid to kind of go against the flow. And this thing is supposed to be coming down this order from someplace up high or whatever. You know, I'm kind of, I could be sent to the rehabilitation project force for the next 10 years for allowing this thing to go down if I don't handle it or at least report it as a treasury secretary. Right. So I write a, I write, you know, like you're supposed to be able to write a report. You know, if all else fails, you can always write to David Miscavige, this little group of guys, which is called Religious Techn Techn Technology Center, or RTC, right? Right. So they have like little wood boxes that have locks on them that you can slip your report into that nobody can prevent the report from going up to David Miscavige's guys. So I put a report in there, not knowing this is David Miscavige's little buddy, that he's the one that's pushing the free service for this guy. So of course that wasn't a, a great move for me. <laughs> wow. So now I'm public enemy number one, and I get told I could either go to the RPF or I could go work in the, the furniture mill that's like about a mile down the street from uh, from the main place in Clearwater. And I'm going to be the, you know, the the sawdust cleaner or something like that for the rest of my CEO career. Right. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not doing the RPF, but I'll go I'll go work in the furniture mill. You know, another thing I can learn, I'll learn the furniture, you know. Yeah. So I go there and I worked there for a couple of years, but then I, I want to, I want to leave the Sea Org. I've had enough. I've done every, pretty much every course, every type of counseling, every type of training you can do. I'm OT7. You know, wait, the wait hope that I, did okay. you get up the OT7? Uh, yeah. On the staff member? Yeah. Well, you boy. know how I did that? Which is incredible. I'll tell you real quickly, because for somebody who does construction type work, to ever go up the bridge is like impossible. Nobody does that, right? I know that. That's why I'm astonished. <laughs> because the church will only invest that kind of counseling to people that they could use to make more money selling counseling and delivering counseling, right? Right. The way I did it was I I would go to somebody who was uh, the super case supervisor that would oversee the counseling, and I'd say, hey, what would you need to be able to supervise my folders? And the lady would say, well, you know, she's in some little shit office, and she said, you know, I, I need more lighting. I, I got folders all over the floor. If I could have shelving, you know, I, if you could paint the place, if you could put a new new hardware on my door for security. And I said, consider it done. I'll do all that for you. You're my supervisor, right? 
Then I go to an order. I'd say, hey, you know, somebody comes for class nine training, you know, the higher level counseling training that I would need to do OT levels and stuff. I say, what would you need in order to uh, audit me on some of the stuff I need? He said, you know, I really hate living in this friggin' student dorm with 15 smelly guys. You know, if I could get my own room, I'm your man. I'm safe. <laughs> I, I set it up. I can give him his own room. Yeah. And then, you know, and I, and somebody, another auditor, I, I said, what do you need? He said, you know, I got almost no air conditioning in my stupid room. It's so hot. I got a little fan, you know, blah, blah. I said, no problem. You know, I went up in the ceiling. I got some flex duct. I tied into the main AC ducting. I ran that thing in and put a louver in the ceiling. I mean, you could freeze meat in that place if you wanted. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I just, I, <laughs> I just wheeled and dealed the whole thing to make myself get all the stuff that I need to get because wow. nobody's going to give you shit in that place. And care how hard you work. They're not going to give it to you unless it benefits them, unless it benefits the church making money. You're not going to get it. Oh, and I, I'll tell you, that was very clever of you. Well, wait a minute. That's the way life is. <laughs> you get something and you get something in exchange for it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. If the whole goddamn Sea Org operated that way, it may be a different scene. If yeah, he had to give give something of value for something he's getting of value. That's right. how life operates. And yeah. it's a great story, man. I got to tell you. <laughs> that, that, so I, anyway, I, I'm, I'm the only person ever to go to OT seven in the Sea Org. You know that. Yeah, I know. As a matter I of fact, know. you probably I, are. Yeah, I know. I probably am. I should I should pay you for doing this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wheel the deal all kinds of shit, man. I even. Man, I can tell you, I even had a 30-foot yacht that I had out in the Clearwater Marina because a, a public came down and he had this big, beautiful boat, you know, sleep four, bathroom, bar, uh, uh, red red carpet, black leather furniture, stereo system, all this stuff, right? And he took it down from, like, Virginia, and he needed somebody to watch it when he wasn't there. And I said, no, I'll watch your boat. You know, in this marina, you had to have a key to get into the place because people lived off their boats there. You had you had showers and bathrooms and laundry. Yeah. I went down there. I, we had poker games there, parties. You know, I fished off that thing a hundred times. It was <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. But anyway, it, here I was the uh, trying to ride out of the Sea Org, right? Yeah. They make it impossible. They say, OK, once you say you want to leave. They've put you into what's called pig's birthing. Pig's birthing is some room that the pipe broke. It got washed out. It's got mold in it. You know, it's no carpet. It's it's just nasty ass. The window's missing. There's no air conditioning. You're in Florida. You get moved into pig's birthing. Right. Nobody will talk to you. You're segregated. Um, you know, your food you get is whatever is left over from the crew. Maybe if somebody has the time to bring it out to where you are. And the bad part of it was when you're a higher level of counseling that you need, you're not going to get it because there's a there's a uh, an order that no high level counselor can audit staff. So you're sitting there and you have you have two you know things you can do. You can either escape, you know, fight your way out of there, whatever, and become what's called a suppressive person which means you're cut off from all your family and any Scientology you've ever known. Or you can go back to to work, yeah. you know? So after a couple of weeks of this shit, you know, all right, good. I'll go back to, the, you know, back to work, right? Yeah. Eventually I had a, uh, it was assigned to the RPF or some dipshit thing, which didn't really matter. But I, I was agreeable to go do it with the idea that, hey, I could route out of the CEO from the RPF because they have their own auditors, their own counselors internally. Right. They have their own system of being able to get out of there. So I agree to go into the uh, rehabilitation project force. And I'm amazed at this place. I'm there for three days and I get told I'm in charge of the 70 people that are in there. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm only I'm like in my mind, I'm already here to get out, not to run this place. Right. But OK, I, I look at all the people are in there, how long they've been in there for. And I see this average of seven years. These people have been in there. I mean, there's people I've been in there for 12 years. And they they might have their wife and kids living 200 yards away in a building that they haven't seen in all that time. They have not seen them, right? I oh, mean, man, you talk the crying. These people are crying. They're li literally losing their minds. I'm not I'm not saying 
little a little bit. I mean, completely losing their minds. They got room there that has so much uh, padding and soundproofing because some of these people scream and make such a fuss when they go in for their auditing that they have to put them in that room to get the counseling. I mean, it's, it's bad, bad. You know, it's it's inhumane. I mean, a person that goes to prison for murder still has the ability a lot of times to have contact with a loved one or they can use a telephone. These guys can't use a telephone. Right. You know, they they can't do shit. They're under guard 24 seven. When they go to sleep at night, there's a guard on that building. They're inside a compound. There's roving security. If you touch the fence, it sets off lights and alarms. If you get over the fence and run, they're going to hunt you down. They will go out of state. They will go out of country to hunt you down. I mean, it's not a joke, you know? Yeah, I know that. And uh, so anyway, I, uh, I'm i trying to route out. And, uh, you know, I eventually, even in the RPF, I say, yeah, I'm, me and Amy, we decided we're going to leave. There's no way she's ever going to get to the program because, you know, she's reporting that David Miscavige is beating people and stuff like that. They're not going to let her outside the RPF to go tell somebody that. No, no way. They, they, no way. She would be a, a high security risk, right? She's a high security risk, right? They have no intention. They've actually even got already a SP declare written on her while she's doing the RPF that they're going to spring on her at some point. Yeah. She wasn't supposed to know that, but there was because there's no way they're going to let her talk to another Scientologist. Okay, good. So we decided we're going to get the heck out of there. So we say, you know, we want to route out, blah, blah, you get separated. You know, you're eating rice and beans three times a day. It's going on for about six weeks. I'm I'm renovating uh, apartments for different uh, executives there and stuff like that as, as what I'm doing during the day. And I'm waiting to get this uh, counseling I need to leave. And the counseling is, it's like the question, have you ever done anything wrong? They're never gonna, they're never gonna let me out of there. I can see it, they're not gonna let me out of there. This is just, they're just playing games and wasting time. So then I was, I was like, that's, you know, this is it, right? I. Yeah. I it's getting videoed. It's going, the video is going to David Miscavige's staff. They're overseeing this thing because it's such a touchy subject. They don't want us to be and Amy to leave. Right. So I just, I threw the, the cans down. I looked into the camera and I said, that's the fuck. Yeah. I said, if me and Amy ain't out of here by 12 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, I said, I'm, I'm, we're walking out. And I said, you don't have a security guard that can stop me. You don't have a, you don't have a gate. You know, anything, if you want to stop me, you're going to have to shoot me in the effing head because we're out of here. And then that was it. I got up and left. And I knew I wasn't kidding. And uh, we were out of there the next day. They tried to keep us separated. They sent her to Seattle. They sent me to my parents' place in uh, Florida. But we were able to connect up again. And I flew to Seattle and, you know, we settled in there and stuff like that. Got married within a couple of weeks. And... We've done really great since then. You know, we made lots of money. We bought a house. Everything's going great. But I will say this. Um, the church still tried to control us when we left. And I would, I'd be at work and get a phone call. Oh, you can't, you know, this is, you know, the church, you know, you can't talk to this person. You can't do this. Do that. I'm like, <laughs> say what? I mean, they use the suppressive person declare as blackmail to control people because they can say, if you don't do this and this, we're going to declare you and you won't be able to talk to your family. Well, they already declared me. They, yeah. The blackmail was gone. There was nothing left to blackmail me with. So I just, you know, I wrote them a letter and I just said, stay away from me. You know, I, I want nothing to do with you guys, right? Yeah. Uh, then we started going around and talking to different uh, people who had left that we had known, you know, veteran people in uh Portland and Seattle and in California and Texas and Florida and Virginia, you know, we were just going around just to, the, the meet up with old friends and they all had the same story. They had all left due to situations with David Miscavige and the, the abuses that they endured from him and witnessed under him. You know, you know there's all these stories about the, uh, the hole where these, you know, these people were kept in these hot trailers and made right. to sleep in there and, and beat each other up. And I mean, all that stuff could be looked up. It's all, you know, it's. No, listen, it's uh, I, I was there when that hole was going on. I mean, yeah. the music studio was maybe 50 feet from the hole, which is a bunch of trailers that were put together. All bars on all the windows. You walk in the front door, there's a security guard there. 
and you had to go through him if you wanted to speak to anybody there. This, anyway, go on, Matt. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, no, it's fine. So anyway, we wound up after about five years or so. We wound up going to Clearwater Beach, and most you know we went to Florida basically because my family was there. Also, Amy was having trouble with the thyroid. We didn't know what it was at the time, but she couldn't get warm. So I thought, well, we go to Florida. It's warm there, you know. And uh, it turned out we, we wound up on Clearwater Beach to be close to family, but also there was a lot of furniture auctions there that we were interested in in the nearby area. The church freaked out that we were that we were in Clearwater. Yeah. And they they probably spent, I'm not exaggerating to say, they probably spent a million dollars to harass us. They hired a whole team of private investigators that were on us 24 seven. They rented the little cottage next to the apartment that we were renting. Um, they followed us everywhere. I mean, if we went on, if we flew back to Seattle to see family, they flew back to Seattle and were waiting for us at the airport. They harassed her, her non scientology family. It was, it was, you know, they put out a magazine with, about, you know, my wife and some others and stuff like that. It was, it was pretty over the top. I mean, the one time we had a, a film crew come to interview Amy about something. The next morning, there was two dead rats in the little pool that we were swimming every day. You know, it was it was trying to intimidate us. Yeah. Um, we wound up talking to the St. Pete Times, which, you know, became uh, headlines there in Clearwater about the different abuses and things like that. And uh, the church was trying to say that, you know, David Miscavige, he never beat anybody, but all these people speaking out, not all of them, but a bunch of them, they, they the ones that were beating people up at the international base, right? And it had these affidavits, legal affidavits, sworn affidavits by some of these top executives still there at the international base, time form an event of these different guys beating people close to death. We were worried about this and that. And this was over their affidavits covered years, right? Yeah. We got a copy of this from from the uh, from one of the uh, newspaper guys that had received this as like you know trying to say that this is really what the truth is, and I saw this and I said, I mean this is proof. What else proof do you need that there was an environment up there where people were beating each other up, and the top of the Scientology was watching this and observing it, and nothing was ever done to change it. Right. So was it accepted, or was these people not able to change it? Either way, if they're the, the guys that run Scientology, there needs to be somebody from the outside to step in and sort this out. Right. So we sent we sent that Amy and I sent that to the FBI. The FBI came to Clearwater, and they uh, interviewed us for two days, and we and they went around to different parts of the country and interviewed other guys too that were witness to a lot of this kind of stuff. And uh, we spoke. You know, Amy wrote a book. We spoke out on radio, TV, uh, Amy went over to Europe. She spoke to some of the uh, government officials over there that were interested in, you know, uh, Scientology is a, a destructive cult and what it could mean to their country and their, their citizens. And I mean, we've done a lot to expose the situation, which is about all we can do at this point is like take responsibility to at least warn people what's going on there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, Matt, you don't fail until you stop trying. Right. So if, and I'll tell you, your, your story is really unique. I, I've never heard a story like this, to be honest with you. And uh, that's why I'm going to just keep on going on. I, I'll never stop doing this. I'll keep on speaking out. Somewhere, some someplace, somebody, maybe in a governmental position or an influential position to the IRS is going to have the balls to say, hey, wait a minute, there's something wrong here and investigate them and find out that they're not a church at all. And if they can take away their tax exemption, I think that's going to be the most effective way to, to have them dry up as it is now, uh, unless you were living under a rock or maybe you're a shepherd in Antarctica. Or <laughs> you're not going to walk into a church if you have any inkling as to what's going on. So the people that are there are in a state of mind that the people in the bubble, they accept this. They, they work. They don't know about it, too, though. You know, there's so much information control. You know, they they don't know about what's going on, on the outside. But and they don't know what's going on from base to base. You know how that is. I mean, I used to say, you know, if, if there was no Scientology in Los Angeles, us, us guys in, in Clearwater, Florida, we wouldn't even know it because we have no contact 
That's absolutely true. But this is this is the way you, you operate if you want to entrap people, and that's what they do. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a key thing for every cult is information control. Yeah. And and they've got it down. You can't you can't watch a TV, listen to a radio, pick up a book, a newspaper. You can't get out of there to travel. You you're just you're shut off, and you just believe what you're being told. Yeah, this is amazing, Matt. I want to thank you for coming on. I, yeah. I, do you have anything else to say? Because I. The other main thing, I mean, if there's ever you know people want to ask you questions or want something to be covered, you know, we could take that up as its own thing. But that's that's kind of a brief, quick cover of the uh, 27 years and. 13 years out. Well, I tell you, it is, I say fascinating, but not fascinating in a glorious way. Right. A very macabre way to, for you to have experienced this and come out on the other end. And you and Emmy are successful at what you're doing and you're leading a nice life, which I really, I'm, I'm very happy for the both of you. Thank you. Anyway, I, I, I just want to chime in, Ron. We do have some questions from the chat. If you guys have time to take sure. it. You have time. I do. Oh, I got time. Okay, um, so Phil Vindication asks, are Matt and Amy still being stalked by Scientology? Matt? Uh, I don't think so. What happened was the last time the guy was parked outside my house, this was about, I guess, four years ago. Um, we have a bus stop there. We had a bus stop there where all these little kids would get you know, dropped off. And uh, after this guy sat out in front of my house for two days, I went out and I said to him, I said, hey, I see you're like eyeballing all these little kids getting off the bus, right? And uh, and he's like, no, no. He's like, you know, I'm not here for the kids, right? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, you don't, you're not from this neighborhood, and you're parked here facing where the little kids get dropped off. And and uh, I said, I'm going to call the police, right? So I called the police with him sitting right there, and he took off, and he was gone. Next day, a whole different guy shows up. So I thought, okay. I walk out there and I say, can you pass on a message? And he said, yeah. I said, you tell them that if you're still here in a half hour, I'm moving back to Clearwater. And they ain't going to like it. And I was for real. I was going to move back to Clearwater. I mean, they had tried so hard to drive me out of Clearwater. I was going to move right back there where people know me, where they make their money. And I was going to, I had some con ideas of how I was going to, you know, make a problem for them. And I didn't do that the last time I was in Clearwater. I didn't touch any of their public, any of their staff. I didn't try to get the message to their staff in public. But I was going to this time. And that was the last time they parked outside my house. There you go. And uh, Judge Fred asked, Ron, have you ever met L. Ron Hubbard? No, I have never met him. Uh, in all the years I was in, I was in Scientology for 42 years and on staff for 26 and a half. Never met him one time. That's it. That's okay. All well, listen, uh, anyway, as you just witnessed, you can call in and ask any questions of myself or the person I'm interviewing. And we welcome that. Uh, maybe there's something we didn't cover that you'd like to know and be happy to answer. And I'm sure our guest would too. So yep. Matt, just to end this off, I want to thank you very much. And it's been my pleasure having you on. Okay, buddy. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So for all of you out there, I'm Ron Miscavige. This is life after Scientology. I'll see you on the next episode.